answer you need to have. Okay, all right, so back here. Now let's look at the classification of the diabetes mellitus. We have the structure in front of us. Let's see what kinds of abnormalities give rise to hyperglycemia. So let's start. First, imagine if there is some reason that we have our immune system, the T cells as I make them like this, T cell. So our immune system attacks the beta cells. Whatever reason, there is an autoimmune issue. There's a defect in our immune system. Immune system somehow figured out that beta cells, or the, the antigens on the beta cells, are our enemy. They started attacking the beta cells and destroying them. Will we have eventually enough beta cells to produce insulin? So that can be one reason, right? This is normally called type 1 diabetes mellitus. We'll, we'll discuss that in detail, but at this time, just this much is enough that our immune system has started destroying the beta cells, and when sufficient quantity of beta cells are destroyed, there is no insulin, and that is type 1 diabetes mellitus. Does anyone know sufficient quantity means what? What do you think? 10% of the cells? That's it, that's the answer. So when we have 80% to 90% of beta cells gone, that is when we abruptly develop diabetes. Okay, so that's one. How about this? We are releasing insulin, the, the cells are there, insulin is being released, but the insulin, when it connects with the receptors, somehow it is not able to connect properly. There is resistance to its action. Is that possible? Yes, there are many mechanisms, and we'll discuss them as well. We have discussed some of those as part of type 2, but this insulin acting on the, res on the res receptors, if there is resistance to this action, so here, this will be type 2 diabetes mellitus. These are the more common general forms that we are all aware of. Can I ask you a question here? Can you think about it and tell me which form, type 1 or type 2, will have increased insulin levels? Why? Good question and good answer. Very good. So what is happening is excellent answer. What is happening is in this case the peripheral tissue is not responding. Glucose is present. When the glucose is present, it is going into the beta cell. Beta cells are present as well. Beta cells are functioning as well. Rather, they are actually overactive because we are kicking them and we are saying, give us insulin. Right? So they are actually producing more insulin than normal. It is just that the peripheral tissue is saying, you know what, I'm not going to listen to you. Make sense? How about type 1? Will we have more insulin? In the beginning, that patient or person, when he has not yet developed the disease, when the 80 to 90 percent of the cells are yet not destroyed, he will have normal insulin levels, or he or she, right? And then, slowly, when the destruction occurs, there will be less insulin. Now, just a very quick, fun thing here to, to notice. Normally, autoimmune diseases are more common in Females or males? Females. Females. Females are more prone to autoimmune diseases. However, in case of type 1 diabetes mellitus, the ratio is 3 men to 2 women. So this is an autoimmune disease where the propensity for the disease is more in men or boys compared to girls. Okay, so this is the second type. What else? What else? can be the reason for hyperglycemia. Number three. So this was number one. This was number two. Number three. What do you think? 
Okay, so it's some genetic, absolutely good. Some genetic issue, genetic issue where insulin molecule, molecular structure has an issue. There is a polymorphism of the molecule. Okay, good. So the structure itself of the molecule is such that it is present, but it is not functioning. Okay, good. I'll give you that. Liver failure when uh, glycogens are not stored properly. Hmm. Okay. Liver failure when glycogen is not stored properly. Yeah, because... Hmm. How about we think about no pancreas? Is that possible? Is there a surgical procedure that is called total pancreatectomy or pancreatico-duodenal tectomy or duodenalectomy? What is that? We remove the pancreas for maybe there is a chronic inflammation of the pancreas or there is a cancer tumor of the pancreas, neoplasia of the, or there is a benign tumor or some other infections, right? So at the end of the day, people decided that this pancreas need to go. In such cases, the pancreas is not present, so there are no beta cells, right? So can I say, number four, exogenous reasons or pancreatic absence, right? All right, any other thing? Hurry up, hurry up. Now you know what to do. You can't say that take all the effector cells out. That would not work. Take all the muscles out, we'll have hyperglycemia. They would not use the glucose anymore. So that's not the, the fun way. How about infections? Do you know any infections? Infections. Hmm. Well, that, that would be not possible, right? Because the whole body is the effector cell, has effector cells. G, what do you think? Infections, how about Coxsackie virus, B, CMV, cytomegalovirus, rubella, right? So all of those viruses can actually trigger issues which will result into destruction of the beta cells and then hyperglycemia. So Coxsackie virus, Coxsackie B virus is a very common one. Cytomegalovirus is very common. Rubella is very common. And not only that, they can actually trigger the immune system to end up creating type 1 diabetes mellitus. Actually, that is one of the major thought for how the diabetes mellitus starts. Because the genetic issues or the chromosomal gene problem with HLA gene, which we'll talk about later when we do the type 1 diabetes mellitus, many people have those genetic problems, but they don't have type 1 diabetes mellitus. So there is some environmental factor that comes in as well. So they, they feel that it may be these viruses. What else? See, so these are the metabolic disorders which can lead up to hyperglycemia. Right? So it's not just the fault of the insulin. There's more than that. What do you think? What else? Any endocrine issues? Any endocrine issues? Endocrine pathologies? Or defects? Yes? Yes, yes. Endocrine issues? Cushing, okay. Tell me more. So many of the endocrine issues, we'll talk about them in detail later on, but many, and for example, acromegaly, Cushing syndrome, pheochromocytomas, what they do is they can end up causing gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, reduce the lipogenesis, sorry, lipolysis, and cause at the end of the day, increase glucose levels. Can hyperthyroidism do it? 
hyperthyroidism. Should hyperthyroidism cause hyperglycemia? Yes or no? <laughs> that is because I'm asking or, or you know the mechanism? Should hyperthyroidism cause hyperglycemia? So there are a couple of, uh, there are a few mechanisms through which this can actually happen. Number one, we know that when there is increased thyroid activity, there is increased metabolic activity in the body. So when the liver's function is gone up, will we produce more glucose? That is one. When GIT's function is gone up, will we absorb more glucose? Yes. And then finally, when we have increased stimulation of pituitary by hypothalamus. So who tells the pituitary to release the thyroid hormones or stimulating hormones? Hypothalamus. And whenever hypothalamus releases or stimulates pituitary, it also releases what? Neuropeptides for appetite. That is very, very interesting. So every time hypothalamus tells the pituitary to release or upregulate the thyroid, it also releases neuropeptides that upregulate appetite. So a person with hyperthyroid will be eating more because the person is receiving signals to eat more. Not only that the BMR is up and he's consuming energy faster, so he needs, he's hungry, he, he wants to eat more. He actually has feed more signals going on as well. So hyperthyroid would do that. Okay, so let's see more. Do you think drugs can do this? Can drugs cause diabetes? Sorry? They can cause hyperglycemia? Okay, so tell me how. Give me an example of a drug that will cause hyperglycemia. Or a class of drug, if not just one drug. Guys, you should be on top of this one. Pharma is done, right? Okay, so let me give you a hint. Beta receptor agonists, beta 2 speci specifically, when these are stimulated, they cause insulin resistance. They increase insulin resistance. How about alpha receptor agonists for beta cell? They reduce insulin release. So there can be drugs that can cause beta receptor agonism or alpha receptor agonism, or there could be drugs that are glucocorticoids. Whose function is this? Right? So drugs can lead to hyperglycemia. What else? What else? We're almost there. Again, the important point here is not to just memorize this list. The important point here is to notice this, that diabetes mellitus is a group of disorders, metabolic disorders, which lead up to hyperglycemia. And these can be a, a lots of reasons that would lead to that. Okay, so what do you think? What else? Has someone ever heard gestational diabetes mellitus? Yes, right, so that is there. Gestational diabetes mellitus, and so on. The, oh, uh, I left the most important one. Can someone tell me, you will earn $20 if you tell me which one was very important and I left it. 
almost as important as type 1 diabetes mellitus. Time to earn money. Come on. That's it. That's it. You both are correct. So maturity on onset diabetes of the young. So what is the percentage? About 80% of the people develop type 2 diabetes mellitus. About 10% of the population develop type 1 diabetes mellitus. Remaining 10% develop all of these remaining things. And in those, the MODI is the most important one. So what is that? What is maturity onset diabetes of the young? Other than the name and the term, any, any light? Anyone who can shed some light on it? Good answer. This is exactly the one that I missed. What is the, what is the pathology in there? So there are genes for, for hepatic nuclear factors which end up resulting in this structure. What happens is in Modi, and somebody was once telling me that Modi is type 1 diabetes mellitus, so that's not true. Modi is not type 1, it is not type 2, it is another type of diabetes mellitus. What happens in this one is, look, in type 1 diabetes mellitus, as we just talked about it, there is an autoimmune component to, it, to that. Modi does not have autoimmune component, and how do we know that? So let's say you receive a patient who is hyperglycemic, you suspect Modi or type 1, how do you rule out type 1? You would look at autoantibodies auto -antibodies that are part of the autoimmune problem in type 1. So Modi usually does not have autoimmune, or I should not say usually, it does not have autoimmune, sorry, autoantibodies. Autoantibodies to, to, the in, to insulin or islet cell antigens or glutamic acid decarboxylase. These are the antigens that usually are participant in type 1 diabetes mellitus. So one, it doesn't have that. So because Modi doesn't have it, Modi is not type 1 diabetes mellitus. Secondly, it does not have insulin resistance. So if you provide insulin to this patient, insulin functions correctly, the patient responds correctly. So peripheral tissue is not resistant to insulin. However, there is just lesser insulin. There is baseline or the lower levels of the insulin release that is present. So such patients actually may be just leading their normal life. And then as they start aging, as they start becoming 20, 25, 30, that is when they start developing some insulin resistance. Number two, their intake, their food intake and their, their habits will probably require them to eat a little more and they would have need for more insulin, which their insulin production cannot meet, resulting in production of diabetes mellitus. Make sense? So if out of all of those, if I recommended that there are three that you must know, these are the three, that is type 1, type 2, and Modi. Got it? Okay, so that is the classification of type 1 diabetes mellitus. Any issues here? Any questions here? All right, now let's very quickly look at the criteria to diagnose.